Andrew, the stage is all yours. I'm a bit worried about the acoustics here. Can you switch off and on your um, microphone again for just a second? Maybe that helps. Sometimes it works now. You still sound um, off. Can you try again? Okay. <clears throat> is it only for me or does everybody here do in a no. way? No, it's, it's very bad. I can hear a kind of fluttering noise. <clears throat> yeah, Edu, may <clears throat> Edu, maybe it helps if you switch off your microphone uh, just for a second or two. And maybe everybody else also switch off their microphone. Let me try to enter again. Then. Okay. Edu, are you there? All right. Can you hear me now? Better? It's much better. Perfect now. Sounds great. Okay, I, start then. I'm using a different computer for the slides that I'm using to talk. So that's why. No, it's perfect now. Please go all ahead. Right. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you, uh, Flaminia, uh, Rob, and uh, Lucien for the invitation and the opportunity to talk here. Uh, also, thank you very much to those of you in Europe. I see there's at the very least, uh, I see several people I know from Europe. I see Juan Leon here. I say Max Ruet. Max, uh, that's cool because I'm gonna talk about stuff that is related to things that you do. So I really appreciate that you're here. Um, let me begin with a little bit of a recap of, um, of a research line that I've been uh, pursuing for some years now related to how to uh, um, talk about measurements in a, in a rigorous way in quantum field theory uh, from the perspective of particle detector. These are all the people or previous students of mine or so current students of mine that I've uh, worked with and I'm gonna mention content that they have developed uh, as well. So let me just briefly present uh, the measurement problem, right? This is a very well known old problem in quantum mechanics, still an open problem. Um, the proposal is at least some measurements can give values. <laughs> That's a reasonable proposal that we can write on a notepad. We measure some value, some observable, and we obtain some numerical value. Now in quantum mechanics, we model that with the notion of idealized measurements. Uh, Born's rule combined with Luther's rule to update the state and the compatibility of uh, sequential measurements. Now, um, of course, there are problems with it. Um, what happens? How come that we go class quantum to classical transition here do they doesn't mean from microscopic to microscopic and the coherence? It means how do I go from a probability distribution to the concrete outcome on a single shot experiment and how to interpret? I'm not going to get into that. The, well, in any case, we know that as an effective tool, it does work, uh, you could not care and still get rich and famous with quantum mechanics, do a lot of successful things and not care about how to handle that. Further problems though appear when we consider QFT. In QFT, it is well known that we cannot introduce idealized measurements. And introducing idealized measurements in QFT, it's incompatible, fundamentally incompatible with the relativistic structure of the theory. This has been uh, uh, developed uh, for a while recently. I mean, there's this paper by Borsten, Jovan Kells, that is uh, a revisiting of the problem and considering finite uh, idealized measurements as well that highlight the problems as they are. So in the absence of an idealized measurement framework in QFT, can we have a measurement theory in QFT? You see the name kind of uh, suggests here uh, leaves the Hilbert space formulation of quantum field theory with no definite measurement theory, removing whatever advantage may have seemed to possess. Well, uh, let's see if we can build one. What is it that we want from a measurement theory? So I'm going to summarize. Uh, this is going to be a little bit quick because of time limitations, but uh, please feel free feel free to uh, ask questions later on or interrupt me even if you want. If there's something that you want to see more detailed. So we want the measurement theory to be capable of producing definite values. So we accept the assistance of single sort experiments where we can get a definite value out of a measurement that we can write down. It needs to provide an update rule. And that means that it needs to have compatibility with future measurements as well. So we need to know what to do if we carry out a measurement in a Cauchy surface, if we do another measurement in a different Cauchy surface, what is the update rule that implements the effect of the first measurement and the compatibility of the data obtained in the first measurement with the second measurement. We also need it to be consistent with the theory, in particular, respect causality and other aspects of uh, the, that correspond to a relativistic theory. And of course, we need it to reproduce experiments. Now, is there an alternative to idealized measurements? I would argue there are several, there are many actually, but I'm gonna focus on one particular alternative that is based on the particle detector approach. Now, what are particle detectors? 
Particle detectors are non-relativistic quantum systems that couple locally to the field. Now, this should maybe ring some alarms. If I have non-relativistic system coupling to the field, how is that going to be compatible with a fully relativistic theory? Well, they may introduce the Andrew DeWitt model. Uh, this is the, one of the most basic models of particle detector use out there. I think it's pretty well known. Um, it's just the coupling of, uh, in this case, that is the simplest case, stationary detector in the quantization frame of the field in flat space time. It's just the coupling of some internal degree of freedom of the detector to uh, the quantum field in a localized manner in space and time. Now, uh, we can examine if such a model satisfies these four requirements that we have. So first of all, does it reproduce, does it connect to experiments? Can we actually apply it in practice to reproduce things that people do in the lab and translate one to one? There are several works that I've done along these lines uh, with uh, several collaborators. And um, in particular, I would just uh, refer to this one, which indeed we saw how uh, we, we actually show how and what conditions the under the coupling captures the fundamental features of the light matter interaction. So argument that I make, yes, it's a good model for the light matter interaction. In fact, it's a better model in terms of fewer approximations made uh, that the models that people actually use in quantum optics. So I'm not gonna talk much more about it. Hopefully you accept that statement. If not, let's talk about it in the discussion time. Consistent with relativity. So is it, it's a non-relativistic quantum system that couples to the field consistent with the theory, as in like respects relativity and relativistic tenets. So in particular, does it respect general covariance and uh, does it not introduce faster than light signaling? So with respect to general covariance, I'm gonna to refer to uh, these works that I did with two students of mine, Bruno and Thales, Rick. And uh, as a quick summary, you can actually uh, prescribe. So of course there are ways and has been done in the, in the, in the literature ways of prescribing under the weight Hamiltonians that are non-covariantly prescribed. So their predictions depend on the reference frame of the coordinates you use to calculate the foliation of space that you choose. That's obviously not an acceptable thing, but if we prescribe the interaction carefully and we assume, okay, we have some Hamiltonian density coupling the detector to the field. And we demand that there's a privileged frame where the detector, uh, the internal coherent force of the detectors keep it approximately rigid. And in that frame, we separate the space time smearing into a switching part, purely temporal dependence, and a smearing part as a product, purely spatial dependence, then we can prescribe the interaction covariantly. And this is the Hamiltonian prescribed that generates translation with respect to the proper time of the detector. And in any other, if you want to use a different foliation, just integrate the Hamiltonian density. All right, so it can be prescribed Covariant. How about uh, not, no faster than light signaling and no problems with retrocausality? Well, uh, we can compute what is the influence of one detector over another. And if they can signal when their space like separated, there's a uh, work that I did in 2015 showing that the microcausality of the field implies there's no FTL signaling between smear detectors. And uh, uh, what about a sorting like kind of problem? What about if we actually use the race of detectors that invade each other's light cone? Do we have a problem similar to Sorkin's? This has been studied in a recent paper with uh, these two students, Jose de Ramon and Maria Papa Giorgio. Uh, and then again, we find that uh, uh, detectors, point light detectors are safe, smear detectors, you can keep scales under control within the approximations of the system being internally non-relativistic. So the claim is that yes, indeed, it uh, can be formulated in a way consistent with the theory. You have to be just careful. You have to, even in flat space time, you have two detectors with different state of motion, just don't sum to under the weight Hamiltonians. Uh, be careful with uh, the covariance prescription. You need to write the Hamiltonian generated translation with respect to one time coordinate, right? To a particular foliation of space. Finally, what about producing definite values on an update rule? Well, this is uh, something that's gonna appear on archive soon. I'm not gonna talk much about it here because this is not the objective of this talk as much, but the idea is that yes, indeed we can we can carry out a measurement in which we couple a detector to the field. Then you measure the detector being non-relativistic. You can measure it with idealized measurements. That induces a POVM on the field. How you implement the POVM of the field is slightly tricky, but indeed you can prove that it's completely respectful with causality and generates a measurement theory and an update rule that satisfies the condition that gets compatibility between experiments and doesn't violate any relativistic principles. All right, so I don't know, I hopefully I've convinced you without many arguments, to be honest, because I'm being very fast, but I've given you at least um, hints that uh, I've looked into or we've looked into 
uh, the particle detector theories uh, introducing an, a viable measurement theory for quantum theory. Now let's look at a very different approach. Now I have to give a disclaimer here. I love this approach that I'm about to expose, uh, about to tell you about, but, uh, but again, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, don't take it as a criticism of it because I really love it. It's more about discussing the limitations of it, the pros and the cons, the strengths and the weaknesses as compared to the, and to the detector or particle detector based approach. I'm going to talk about the Fuster Birch framework a little bit. So, the Fuster Birch framework is extremely elegant. The only assumptions really that go into it are much nicer, if you want, than anything that you, do, you would do with particle detectors because it's just the axioms of QFT. Those are pretty uncontroversial axioms. I wish I had time to talk a little bit about them. They're, uh, for those of you who know them, nothing much to say, but uh, if you're not familiar with them, they are extremely reasonable assumptions that you have to make in order to build a quantum field theory. Now, uh, this is uh, Weinman, Hag, Araki, and Kassler, which you can actually classify perhaps as the founding fathers of uh, the axiomatic formulation of QFT. Now, very, 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 very brief summary to be able to have time to talk about something else. Uh, the framework basically establishes fully rigorously that the detector is going to be treated as a fully relativistic QFT, a proper QFT. We have a target field theory that we want to measure. We have a pro field theory that represents the detector system. And then we have a couple field theory, which is an interaction theory between the probe field and the target field. And in particular, we can rigorously construct the scattering maps that map free theory before the measurement to the free theories after the measurement. So the detectors in this case are modeled by a QFT. Now, the problem, again, this is an extremely elegant and rigorous formalism. The problem, if you want, or the missing step, if you want, is who measures the measurement apparatus here? Because it's, again, a quantum field theory. And as I discussed at the beginning, there is no measurement theory for QFTs. So the assumption that is made in the Fusterverse formalism is, I'm going to quote uh, Chris Fuster here, someone somewhere knows how to measure something. There is somebody that can process that profile and extract the information from it. And we get to the point that uh, the, the main thing that I want to talk about it in this talk. Uh, this is this, this very, very nice paper written by Max Ruhe uh, that's called Weekly Couple Local Particle Detectors Cannot Harvest Entanglement. And that title is big <laughs> because uh, many people here in RQI have worked in some capacity uh, in entanglement harvesting. And if you read that, you say, oh, hold on, what? <laughs> So it certainly, it definitely gets attention. This is a wonderful paper, I recommend everybody to read it. Um, let me quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with that, a quick uh, recap of what entanglement harvesting is. This is something that was first uh, proposed by Valentini in the 90s, then rediscovered by uh, Resnick in the 2000s. And entanglement harvesting, basically you have two detectors that are space-like separated. They start in an uncorrelated state, but interacting only with the field, they end up entangled. Of course, that's not so surprising when we actually look at a very simplified model. How do you get, imagine you're given the problem of getting to systems A and B that start in an uncorrelated state and you want to get them entangled and you allow them to interact locally with a chain of harmonic oscillators, say, in the ground state. Well, there are two possible mechanisms, right? You couple them locally. And of course, the coupling excites the harmonic oscillator chain and the excitations travel from A to B and get them entangled, so they get them correlated. So indeed, you can actually create entanglement through communication. But there's another mechanism, which is the, the fact that you can take advantage that in the ground state of the harmonic oscillator, there is entanglement. Between two distant nodes of that uh, network of harmonic oscillators, there is entanglement. You can couple locally to it. It's going to look random. Uh, what it looks like, the outcome of this coupling is going to feel like random fluctuations for A and B, but they are correlated. And through these correlations, you can swap the entanglement. So these this fluctuations that A and B experience, they can get entanglement. You're basically extracting entanglement that exists in the chain. And that's not limited by the speed of sound. That's the phenomenon of entanglement harvesting. So we go back to uh, this paper. By the way, uh, OK, well, let, let's begin with this. So in the paper, uh, uh, let me distinguish a little bit how this is going to work. We have regions. Uh, we have two fields that are detector fields. And of course, we have the author of this paper here. So if I misrepresent anything, please feel free, <laughs> feel free to tell me. We have uh, 
two interaction regions where we have two different profiles that couple to a target field. And let's say the regions could be space-like separated, right? And then there's in the causal future of this coupling region, there is a processing region where somebody has access to a localized mode of those fields, of those probe fields. And then it's gonna look at the entanglement acquired by these two modes, localized modes of the two probe fields. All right. Now, uh, let me summarize a little bit the intuition behind this. Since the detector, the detector fields in this case are localized, are localized modes that, that what we're gonna access are localized, mo localized modes of the detector fields, uh, risk leader arguments will tell us that there is entanglement with that field outside of the localization area, and that is gonna introduce an avoidable mixedness. Now, local probes here, so far, they're model independent because they're not, there are no assumptions about the nature of the probe quantum field. Uh, yeah, the, the probe, not probe, the probe field, the, the detector fields, if you want, other than they are relativistic QFTs. So, I mean, in principle, they could be some bound system of some complicated QFT. Now, of course, mixedness in the detectors is bad for entanglement harvesting. We know that. Uh, there's something in preparation. I will talk more about it. For Andrew DeWitt detectors, and under some approximations, this as a measure of entanglement and leading order, we have mixedness, a degree of mixedness setting the detectors literally acts like a source, an extra source of local noise, that mixedness. Mixedness is bad for entanglement harvesting. So maybe that is gets in the way. Now, before, uh, before getting into the particulars, I think a very relevant reading here, and uh, you can understand why soon, is this really, really beautiful paper uh, written by my former supervisor, Juan Leon, and a team of friends of, of both of us, which is great. That's called, what does it mean for half a, an empty cavity to be full? Again, if you haven't read it, totally recommend it. Very related with what I'm about to tell you. Now, this I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to tell you is uh, work in preparation with Bruno and Dan. Uh, Bruno's a student of mine, that's former student of mine, now uh, in Oxford. Now, uh, the work by Max shows that there will always be mixedness in the detector modes, the ones that you use, the localized modes that you have access to in the processing region. And because of that, because of the fact that it's a QFT, and that's related to Chris Leader's theory, related to the fact that we have entanglement, actually, in the, it's the, it's the very thing that we're trying to measure and acknowledge that gets in the way for the probe fields in order to harvest entanglement. Now here we're gonna ask the question says, okay, how about when we consider detectors that are physical and or in terms of the scales that uh, we use with those detectors and do the details about the detectors matter for the claims in the paper? Now to make further claims about entanglement harvesting after the introduction of the setup and showing that this mixness is fundamental no matter what you have, uh, Rook's paper employs three scalar fields as the detector field theories. Of course, they're gonna look at localized modes, but they're free scalar fields. And then assume that in the processing region, one has access to a localized mode of those fields. Edu, you are at the 20 minutes mark now. Okay, five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So here is a, a calculation that we can do uh, in terms of modes localized in a cavity. So we have a long cavity of, of uh, let's say one meter length. This is all a dimensional, but let's take atomic scales. We can see here how there's uh, inside the cavity, which is one meter, you can localize your mode um, in different, you can localize your, your mode to different scales. If the mode is very localized, if you go to small, small support of the mode, of course, the mixedness increases. If you go to a larger support, mixedness decreases. This is purity that is being represented here. And of course, if you increase the temperature, this is considered a thermal state of the, of the free field in the cavity, if you increase the temperature, also mixedness increases, the purity decays very fast. If you actually say, okay, I'm gonna localize my modes in the typical scales corresponding to an atom, then we see that the localization scales are these ones. The dimensional localization number is this one. So the length of the mode with respect to the length of the cavity, but the thermal parameter is huge. In fact, we are in the very blue region of this plot. Now, Two conclusions to extract from that. If you have any temperature, we're talking here about 4.2 Kelvin. This is liquid, not liquid helium temperature. If you have any kind of temperature, thermal mixedness overpowers the, overpowers the rich leader induced mixedness. More than that, mixedness is way too high. If this localized modes were models for something that are related to atomic probes or something that we can use in the lab as a quantum detector, we'd not be able to do anything with them. They're very mixed. In the lab, we can prepare ground state of atoms with purity above 0.999. So yeah, maybe 
the consequence perhaps is that free fields, even when the modes are localized, are not good models for probes that you can build in the lab, and we can discuss it. One certainly needs to consider the physics of bound systems here. Now, of course, ideally, you would consider a full QFT where uh, you have the detector being a bound system of that QFT. However, those are arguably outside of what we can calculate and compute with. The best we have so far is particle detector models. So this is an argument, this is again, an argument for uh, a detector model approach to look at entanglement harvesting. Now, something even perhaps more disturbing, where you can ask when you have localized modes of the field and you look at the entanglement of these two localized modes of the two probe fields that couple to the target field to extract entanglement, you can ask where does the mixedness live in those modes? The shape of the modes, not just the scale, the shape matters. Uh, we can prove a little theorem that uh, uh, you can find modes. So these are, this is building a mode that is localized. This functions, this is the, the field phi, the target field, sorry, the probe field. And this is the canonical conjugate momentum according to some foliation. You can localize them in a smooth, compactly supported way. And you can prove that it's possible to find, it's possible to find uh, shapes for which the modes are arbitrarily pure regardless of this localization. We just need to tame the UV is where does, where do those modes store the entanglement? It's storing the UV components of the field. So the shape, the details about what this detector model is matter for the conclusion, for the numerical value of the conclusions. I'm not saying what Rueff proof is wrong, quite the opposite. What Rueff proof is, what Max proves there is perfect, it's correct, it's a theorem. There's no argument against it. It's the realistic scales and the kind of red detectors that those localized modes could be represented that I'm talking about here. Now, how do you model a realistic detector with the fuster verge formalism? Well, I don't know why I have a W there, so should be a regular V. Without a concrete interaction theory and without solving bound states, I would argue that the general formalism has still too many free parameters and it won't just work taking free field theories and localized modes. This is what I take out of these results. Now, finally, this is the final slide. Um, I argued a little bit about how particle detectors can provide a uh, uh, measurement theory for QFT that satisfies these four requirements that if you actually take those four requirements as the requisite to have a measurement theory, it can satisfy that. And uh, let me end with a notion that was pretty controversial last time I mentioned it, but I'm gonna mention it again, a little bit more refined. The notion of the relativistic cut. All measurements end up done at some level where non-relativistic approximations on the internal structure of the detectors are not bad and do not mess with the relativistic nature full uh, of the field or its causal structure. Uh, the spelling here is not great, but hopefully you get it. Uh, meaning that, well, when we measure quantum field theories, from the point that the quantum field theory is about to be measured to the point where we write down or we get in the screen of a computer a number telling us a quantity that has been measured, there is a point. It could be all the way far into the computer internal dynamics electronics where even though the systems are fundamentally relativistic, doing a non-relativistic approximation does not screw up the theory and connects, provides this bridge between the human experience of writing down a value and understanding a theory and the fundamental notions of physics that are being measured. Anyway, that's all I want to say. And again, thank you very much, everybody, and in particular, European ones. And Max, thank you for being here for this talk as well. <laughs> that's it, thank you very much. Thanks, Edu. <clears throat> Um, questions? We have about five minutes for questions left. Lucia? Oh, yeah, you're clapping, okay. Yeah, everybody's clapping. <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, hello, can I just jump in? Yes. Fabio. Uh, yeah, just a very quick comment. Um, yeah, about the the fact of using a uh, field model, um, detector model based on field, just to say yeah. that I have some uh, uh, some uh, work from many, many years ago on that, which is a very, very simple toy model, but the, the only thing relevant to this discussion is that uh, uh, the detector is not a free field. In fact, the detector is made by two fields that kind of uh, uh, mimic the, the process of a bound state, uh, say capturing or releasing a a photon. So it's not exactly what you're talking about. That would be more complete to, to model with the bound states. 
uh, of a field, but but I think it's uh, something that perhaps goes in that direction in the sense you have a, an interacting field theory that right. works as a detector model. So, so, so the one thing to say to this though, Fabio, I, I, I agree. So the, the one thing to say is that this is, the nice thing about the field array framework is that it's extremely fundamental. This thing is rigorous. This is pure math level of rigorous. Yeah. Um, uh, I agree that getting the right bound system would be the ideal way to do it, what you're saying and proposing, like connecting that to the experiment is where the problem usually comes, uh, not, uh, not the proposal itself. But yeah, no, for sure, Fabio, I don't know. Can, can you send me that reference too? I, I actually don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in, in, in the chat uh, okay. so I can mute myself and look for the reference and I put it in the chat. Thank you. Andrew, it, it used to be thought that um, the more rigorous you make quantum field theory, the harder it gets to describe interaction. That is correct. And so what's new there? How did they overcome this? Oh, uh, in, the, in practice, they don't really work with, uh, with interactive theories. Uh, when calculations are done in practice, it's free theories, what they use. Yeah, but then you want to use a field to detect using and, interaction. And that's the limitation, right? That's what I was pointing out as the limitation. Uh, ideally, you want to describe the detector as a bound low energy emergent system out of the QFT, right? That's the step that's missing. Yeah. There are three. I see Rob, Max, and, and Alex. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I don't know who was first. Uh, maybe uh, Rob? Rob, if you go first. But everybody, uh, please keep it short so that everybody gets to talk. I'm very interested in hearing yeah. Max, too. <laughs> go ahead, okay. Rob. Yeah, OK. I just, so basically, you. If I understand it correctly, you're saying to the extent you could use a quantum field as a kind of detector um, in practical regimes, it's completely untenable because thermal effects will overwhelm. If you uh, use a free field, if you use a localized mode of a free field as a detector, then yes. Of course, what you would want to use is not a free field, right? But then you don't know how to do the calculations typically because interactive bound states of interactive theories, right? Are impossible in principle with our knowledge of physics currently. So what I'm trying to understand is, is there any regime where you could use it? Like let, you know, how low would the temperature have to be or, you know, or what, what would have to be done for this to work at all? I don't yeah, know. Right so here, what, what I would say is that what you need to provide is how really are you measuring those localized modes of the fields? How do you access them? I would argue that this is at least one case in which it's difficult to associate a physical detector in a lab with those localized modes of the field. I don't know. I'm not doing the positive one. I'm doing in this scenario, I'm looking at some evidence that tell us that they might not be the best models for things that you can couple in the lab. Well, well yeah, I see that. Eduardo, but the UNRU effect, I mean, it's an in principle effect, but the actual accelerations were ridiculously high. Yeah. Um, so shouldn't we know, you know, where this actually could work? I would say whenever you have an experiment, if you show me an experiment where you really address this one to one, you do a state swapping, for example, if you can swap the state of a mode of the field to something that you can control and you can do measurements on then I think this would work, this would be perfect. All that I'm arguing here is that it's not an atomic probe. These localized modes of the fields are not an atomic probe. It's a different kind of probe. And I don't know of any physical system that would be modeled by this. That's I mean, even a single photon in a wave packet, you know, that's just a localized mode of a free field. I mean. Uh, how do you measure that? That's the point, right? Yeah. The thing is that uh, the whole point of rigorously speaking, if you want to measure compatible with relativity and where space-like separation matters, all the quantum optics, usual approximations, make approximations that break down that already. So if you want to keep it, if relativity doesn't matter for your experiment, pretty sure that you can say, okay, I address this weight packet by doing a thousand identical experiments and taking this amount of time. The point is when the relativity actually matters for your experiment. Uh, in those cases is when you run into the sorting problems kind of thing that you can't um, really measure the field. I, I, I think we should um, postpone the continuation of that um, discussion together, Town. Shall we just oh. give uh, Max a chance to quickly ask a question Please. and then we go into the gather Town. Maximilian? Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, I just have uh, maybe two, two quick comments that... Um, go ahead. Uh, um, 
First of all, I, I, I completely agree that um, at the end of the day, that the thing that we would want is to, to model bound states in the QFT and um, to have a, a better model of a detector. I guess the, um, also the, the underlying idea of the, of the Fuster Fair framework is um, to use quantum fields and thereby to kind of have this, um, this, this, this fundamental notion of, uh, of, of quantum fields also on the probe side. So to, to keep this on, on, on this, let's say fundamental, fundamental level and do not go into these approximations there, which is of course also why it's, it, it's very hard to come up with a good um, quantum field theory model of, of a detector, which is also why these kind of three modes are, well, the, the first thing you could think of and the first thing you could model. Then um, you could probably Im improve this up to a certain point by including some external fields that mimic some walls of a cavity or so, and you have a, um, still a mode of a, of, of a linear field that, that, that interacts with an external potential or an external field that mimics the mode. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting what you're uh, what you're saying. So there, there's definitely it, it seems like there's definitely room to to explore this further and to um, to address uh, some of the points that. So, so, so Max, when we finish when we finish writing this up, which is relatively close to completion, we're just trying to be careful. We will certainly send you a draft before and discuss it with you before we put it up. And uh, and again, I don't want anybody to understand this as an attack to the formalism, quite the opposite. I think we all want the same and like this format. I also realize again, that I'm butchering what was how, the right pronunciation? Ber. Ber, okay, yes. Sorry, my German, <laughs> I think oh, yeah. German is really bad. Okay, I, I think we should move to the gather town. And then when we come back from the gather town, we should get back to uh, Magdalena's question briefly. And then uh, Rob takes over with the uh, general.